Okay, so, not to call anyone out here, but there appears to be five factoids about Vib Ribbon that it seems anyone writing about it is contractually obliged to mention. It's from the people who made Parappa the Rapper. It has a vector-based art style. You can use your own CDs to play the game. It is, quote-unquote, Japanese. It is a cult. Classic. I have a small gripe about the typical usage of the term cult classic in relation to video games. Not just this one, I'm talking about video games in general. The term cult classic is a holdover from the days of magazines and physical media, when knowledge about a piece of media was reliant on either local availability or word of mouth. Earthbound was a cult classic because a quirky RPG with relatively simplistic graphics wasn't of much interest to the average gaming magazine critic or 90s teenager. At least, that's what they tell you anyway. I say Earthbound was a cult classic because, well, is it really that obscure anymore? Ness, Earthbound's protagonist, is a playable fighter in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the best-selling fighting game of all time. For free 99 USD a month, including tax, you can play Earthbound on Nintendo Switch, the third best-selling console of all time. Earthbound regularly makes Don do best video games of all time lists, where it is almost always referred to as a cult classic. It's now gone to the point where Earthbound's popularity is used as both setup and punchline in reference to the games it has inspired. Making a quirky RPG inspired by Earthbound isn't impressive anymore. It's too mainstream. I feel kind of the same way about Vib Ribbon. Don't get me wrong, there's roughly a grand canyon's worth of disparity between Vib Ribbon's popularity and Earthbound's. Vib Ribbon wasn't even released in the US until one of PlayStation's money men realised they never actually got around to it. And it's still confined to the PS3, Vita, and PSP, none of which Sony make anymore. But at the same time, Vib Ribbon isn't exactly obscure. I first heard of Vib Ribbon from a YouTube video with 1.3 million views. If you happen to miss the E in Vibe when searching YouTube, Vib Ribbon and other associated searches are the first to be suggested. Yes, I know YouTube isn't the best gauge of a game's popularity. I also know that was an obscure hidden gem in the Western world is mainstream elsewhere. Dragon Quest being represented in Smash was met with a lot of confusion and crying over a wasted DLC slot, but Dragon Quest is literally in Yakuza 0. Maybe Vib Ribbon is still really popular in Japan. On the other hand, have you even heard of Hot Pixel, Atari's simultaneously hilarious and hilariously bad WarioWare knockoff for the PSP? Vib Ribbon is in the Museum of Modern Art. Hot Pixel isn't. What I'm trying to say here is that I know that I'm not exactly breaking new ground when I restate about three of those aforementioned factoids later in this piece. Maybe you already know about Vib Ribbon, maybe you don't. I chose to write about Vib Ribbon because I found the specific way it chooses to interpret CDs to be interesting. If you just want to hear about that, skip the next section. If not, well, here's a dump truck's worth of context for you. Vib Ribbon is a rhythm game developed for the original PlayStation by Nana Onsha, who also developed the far more popular Parappa the Rapper. In Vib Ribbon, you control Vibri the Rabbit as she travels down the titular Vib Ribbon. This is where Vib Ribbon's plot begins and ends. The Vib Ribbon is a straight line that seemingly continues forever. If there is an end to it, I've never seen it, and there's no telling where exactly the Vib Ribbon began either. Now, no landmarks, no suggestion of which material the Vib Ribbon is made out of. If Vibri and the Vib Ribbon didn't exist, the world of Vib Ribbon would be an empty void. But this isn't as terrifying as it sounds. No, quite the opposite, as whenever music is playing, the Vib Ribbon vibrates, and when it vibrates, it changes. This is where Vib Ribbon's gameplay resides. Press L1 to leap over a block. Press down on the D-pad to cross pits. Press R1 to navigate loop-de-loops. And press X to roll over spikes. Use these four buttons to navigate the obstacles that the Vib Ribbon forms in time with the music. Vib Ribbon doesn't just navigate these obstacles, however. She parkours over the blocks, extends her legs to cross pits, and slides through loops. She doesn't walk or run, but skips along the Vib Ribbon. When you finish a stage, Vib Ribbon excitedly tallies up the score. No matter how poorly you did, Vib Ribbon is always pleased with the result. If you get a high score, Vib Ribbon bursts into song. 
This isn't just confined for text either. Vibri has a voice and speaks in crunchy, highly compressed Japanese. She sings the tutorial to you, yelling out inputs in time with the music. Her first words when you start this tutorial are It's obvious that navigating the Vib ribbon is how Vibri gets her kicks. Conversely, pressing the wrong button or mistiming an action causes Vibri to collide with the obstacle, screaming in anguish. If you get a game over, Vibri might tell you to practice more, or she might just burst into tears, or even start screaming at you. Navigating the Vib ribbon means everything to Vibri. Navigating the Vib ribbon means everything to me, too. When I miss a jump in Super Mario 64, and Mario hits the ground with a <laughs> as he's cartoonishly squashed by the impact, I'm annoyed. When Vibri gets hurt by an obstacle, I feel bad. The world of Vibribbon is represented by simple vector lines, and when Vibri is hurt, she loses parts of herself, devolving into a frog and then a worm as she loses complexity and composure. If you play well though, Vibri is transformed into an angel with an intricate crown and wings. Vibri is my avatar, but she's also my friend, and I don't want to see her get hurt. I want to see her flourish. I can't think of that many games where I care this deeply about the well-being of the protagonist, but Vibribbon manages to turn every correct input into a triumph, and every mistake into a desperate struggle. Desperate is perhaps an understatement. You see, you need to perform 20 correct inputs in a row to evolve, but it only takes 9 mistakes to devolve, and that count doesn't reset until you either evolve or devolve. When you take a hit, both Vibri and the Vibribbon continue to vibrate long after the impact with the effect intensifying as you inch closer to a de-evolution, which makes it all the more difficult to visually parse the road ahead. Vibribbon is a game where your victory is often temporary, but your mistakes tend to stick around. And that isn't the only trick up Vibribbon's sleeve. Shifts in a song's tempo can cause the game to slow down or speed up, with sudden changes causing obstacles to shift around the Vibribbon erratically, tightening the period you have to enter the correct input and clear them. In the last set of stages, Vibribbon introduces combined obstacles that require two simultaneous inputs to clear. Perhaps a block has spikes on it, so Vibri must roll as she clambers over it. Or a loop has a sudden pit at the top, meaning Vibri needs to jump from one part of the loop to the other, instead of being able to clear it in one smooth motion. This seems about as good time as any to actually discuss the music that makes up Vibribbon's stages. It's... fine. It's fine! I fully admit that I'm not that well versed in music. I often find I have trouble with describing different sounds, or being able to pin a song or artist down to a specific genre. So I apologise in advance if my descriptions and comparisons are inaccurate, but with that said, Vibribbon's music is generally an offensive 90s J-pop. If you absolutely needed to, you could compare it to city pop. If you're some kind of sick freak, you might describe it as dreamcore or hyperpop. It's Showa-era idol J-pop, if Showa-era idol J-pop was actually interesting. If you spend as much time digging through Spotify playlists as I do, you've heard it before, and you'll hear it again at least one more time before you die. Despite these somewhat wide-reaching and vague comparisons, the soundtrack often blurs together into the sound of Vibribbon. Or Sample, perhaps better known as Polaroid, and Do You Know, aka Laugh and Peace, Stand out by virtue of being more experimental, but since there's only 6 songs in total on the Vib Ribbon disc, they simultaneously feel too prominent and too inconsequential in relation to the rest of the soundtrack. With the exception of the aforementioned or sample, the lyrical content is nothing too special either, discussing growing up, relationships, and partying. Most songs are sung in English, with the last two featuring Japanese lyrics, but all of the lyrics have a tendency to blend in with the noise of the instruments, making it difficult to parse what the singer is actually trying to convey. What Vibribbon lacks in musical substance, however, it makes up for in level design. The first song, or sample, serves as an excellent opener, with the bass of the song made up by four drum beats, followed by the sound of a camera shutter for the fifth beat, 
This acts as a sort of metronome for the player, teaching them the timing required to clear each obstacle. At around the 1 minute 58 mark, the song gradually builds and speeds up, throwing obstacles quicker and quicker at the player, asking them to demonstrate the skills that they just learned by keeping up with the increasing tempo. It's a taste of what's to come. This is where Vibribbon tries to sell you on Vibribbon. Levels in Vibribbon are presented as sets of two songs, each divided by difficulty. After or sample, the game switches to the far more traditional sounding Oops, also known as Sunny Day. Despite the slight genre shift and relatively faster tempo, obstacles are still timed to the beat, which is kept clear and distinct from the rest of the track. It's a different sounding song, but the core is still the same. The second set starts with Do You Know, which begins by clustering the obstacles a bit tighter than the first set before introducing the concept of a shifting speed, starting with a near glacial slowdown and ending with an intense speed up. This is followed up by Hot Play, also known as Universal Dance, which consists of three sections which each repeat their own set of obstacles with each section being slightly faster than the last. It's a somewhat brute force way of draining the input timings into the player, and one that sticks out somewhat from the rest of the levels, but I suppose it does get the job done. The final set begins with Trip Out, also known as Overflowing Emotions. Trip Out is something of a culmination of the included songs, cleverly introducing the concept of combination obstacles by having you clean their individual components first. It then evolves the time distortion introduced in Do You Know by asking you to clear a similar section, but now with the added challenge of clearing combination obstacles. It also rather subtly introduces the concept of shifting obstacles. This leaves the final song, Going On, also known as Roll Along, feeling a bit flat. The song doesn't really have anything else to introduce apart from some as yet unseen combination obstacle types, so it reads as more of an encore. Perhaps appropriate, considering its upbeat pop instrumentation and, if we're to believe existing translations, cheerful lyrics. Okay, to be fair, you did click on an essay with the word pointless right there in the title. Bib Ribbon is a game that I like, and playing it made me want to write about it. Maybe it doesn't need to mean anything. But I didn't write this essay simply to go, Whoa, look at this cool hidden gem on the PlayStation. I wrote this because I have 16 gigabytes worth of audio CD images on my hard drive, and it's all Vibribbon's fault. See, due to its vector-generated art style and heavily compressed voice clips, Vibribbon's core gameplay can be stored entirely within the PlayStation's 2 megabytes of RAM, allowing the player to eject Vibribbon's disc and insert their own CD. And this is where Vibribbon turns from novelty to obsession. The game has broken free of its six song shackles and now threatens to swallow your music collection whole, begging you to try any and all styles of music to see how it affects the Vibribbon. However, this isn't a perfect process, and that's where things start to get interesting. For starters, I don't actually have a music collection to use with Vibribbon. Don't get me wrong, if I like someone's stuff and it's on Bandcamp, I'll happily pay for it. I'm not a monster. But for the rest of the artists I like, whose record companies obfuscate who actually gets paid in the end, I stream their music on Spotify's free tier like the little parasite I am. And even if I did have a CD collection, my computer doesn't even have a disk drive in it, meaning that I'd have to drag my external DVD drive out of storage every time I wanted to use a CD with Vibribbon. There has to be a better way. Enter Magic ISO. Magic ISO is old ass software from the Windows XP days for burning music to a CD, but it can also convert music to the binary image format Vibribbon expects. Magic ISO expects you to pay for this privilege, refusing to cram more than 300 megabytes worth of music into a single image unless you cough up. Except what the software doesn't know is that Magic ISO Incorporated doesn't even have a website anymore, meaning it's constant pleas to order now for an even deafer ears than they would have back when the company was still around. And the fun doesn't stop now, because I'm dumb enough to insist on using 4K video downloader for converting songs that I've legitimately acquired for YouTube music to MP3. Meaning if I download too many songs, OOPS! Guess I can't download that video file I need for editing the video version of this essay. Even after all of that, it's not as simple as just insert MP3 get CD. MP3s have a tendency to slow down when imported, so first I have to batch convert my MP3s to audio CD WAV files using VLC. This decompresses them, which means I can only fit around 20 to 30 minutes worth of music in a single image, and that in turn means I'll need to split my music over multiple images. 
Someone could write something interesting about this. Not me though. I'm here for the big time. Peter Gabriel's big time, that is. See, the PlayStation, even back in the day, wasn't exactly a powerhouse. This means Vibribbon has to work under two technical constraints. It can only see ahead to generate new obstacles by 8 seconds, and it can only detect changes in frequency as opposed to tempo or melody. This means a track like Big Time, with an easily distinguished rhythm coupled with a prominent guitar and Gabriel's trademark vocals, provides a near-official experience. Big Time is an exception though, not the rule. Vibribbon really does try its best, but it often misreads the song ahead, throwing in seemingly arbitrary obstacles just the same as it throws all semblance of rhythm, game balance and game design out the window. While Vibribbon's included tracks offer a smooth difficulty curve, custom songs often throw you in the deep end, asking you to clear several complex combination obstacles in a row without any kind of beat or rhythm to guide you, and so it creates a sort of anti-rhythm game. One where most songs actively try to throw you off rather than guide you. You stop trying to develop a rhythm for your inputs and instead read each obstacle visually as they come at you, like reading a piano roll. It's perhaps appropriate that Vibribbon is recommended when you misspell vibe, as it asks you not to memorise each input but instead to vibe and play with the cards that you're dealt. The way it uses these changes in frequency to generate levels isn't easy to predict either. This is quickly evidenced by feeding Vibribbon's music back into itself, generating remixed level designs that actively go against what the game initially taught you. Or Sampo is transformed from a slow-paced introduction to Vibribbon's mechanics to a turbocharged heck gauntlet. It's a complete betrayal of everything Or Sampo stood for in favour of crude overload. I love it. The game has shown you heaven, and it has shown you hell. Now, it asks you to spin the wheel once more. Any song in your library could be a new kind of sleeper hit, rendered unto Hamlet by a decades-old monkey's procedural generation typewriter. Vibribbon, in a way, will live on indefinitely. There's always new music coming out, so there's always more stages to play. Kero Kero Bonito, probably my closest reference point for Vibribbon's built-in music, initially seemed to produce the kind of near-official levels you'd expect, until songs like If I'd Known and Lip Slap absolutely blindsided me. While Time Moves Slow most certainly does not move slow, I found that Vibribbon's spartan black and white presentation only enhanced the feeling of melancholic regret and longing. Tires on Fire proves that if Vibribbon was released on Steam right now with MP3 support, it'd be up there with Beat Saber. The already haunting The Ocean Floor became absolutely unreal when paired with Vibribbon, and Supervillain, The Evil One, and the all-time anthem for Burnt Out 20-somethings Bugbear all almost seem to be constructed with Vibribbon playback in mind. And I haven't even begun to scratch the surface here, because it took me 62 seething minutes to beat Scratch the Surface from the week that was, and after that I thought I had reached the peak of difficulty for Vibrib and Custom Songs, until Zombie by Bad Pony ended with obstacles that came at me so fast that I'm not actually sure if it's humanly possible to clear them without taking damage. Genesis opens with a downright masochistic level layout, a gruelling endurance test that then gives way to a drop that, after which, for just the briefest moment, manages to sync up exactly with Vibribbon's generated level layout. For 35 seconds, Vibribbon is a perfect game, free of any and all limitations. It doesn't take long to come crashing back down to reality. Broken, offbeat reality. I kept playing for two and a half hours after I barely finished Genesis. It's probably the closest I've ever gotten to being hypnotised by a video game. And so, the Vibribbon continues on, endlessly. Victories and failures alike are fleeting, discarded with every new song. Vibribbon is a game you cannot ever truly win, and can never really lose. Vibribbon only ends when you've decided you've had enough, and turn the game off. It is, in a word, pointless. Maybe that's why I like it so much.